Let me get started. It's really an honor for me to introduce Michelle Murad. Um, she serves as the Vice Chair of Clinical Affairs and Value at the Department of Medicine at University of California, San Francisco. Um, also as Medical Director of Transitions in Care, Clinical Informatics Lead for the Center for Digital Health Innovation, and serves as a professor in the Department of Medicine at UCSF Health under um, the infamous uh, Bob Wachter, who uh, along with Lee Goldman published the article in the New England Journal of Medicine, um, using and noting the term in the medical literature of hospitalist. Um, it transformed my life, certainly, and that program has continued um, to really influence uh, hospital medicine across the uh, U.S. and internationally. Um, she uh, obtained her bachelor's in chemistry from Williams College and then graduated from medical school at New York University and then was a resident at internal medicine at UCSF and then completed uh, probably was one of the first fellows in hospital medicine in the U.S. at UCSF in a program that continues to this day. Joining the Division of Hospital Medicine faculty in 2009, and very quickly um, set her mark as a superb medical educator. She's won the Teaching Award for Excellence in Teaching and Mentoring for, from the House staff, and also Medical Student Excellence in Teaching Award from the medical school itself. She's really been focused on value improvement in general, particularly transitions in care, health equity, patient and provider satisfaction, and making healthcare more efficient um, through use of informatics to improve care delivery. In her role as vice chair, she's responsible for overseeing performance improvement and clinical strategy in all these areas across the continuum of care. In her work as clinical informatics lead in the Center for Digital Health Innovation, she oversees the implementation of digital tools to improve care delivery, patient and clinician satisfaction. And it's published extensively in all these areas. Um, we're, we gave, she gave us a great presentation yesterday and I'm looking forward to learning more from her as she talks about um, where we're headed um, in care delivery and what got us here isn't gonna necessarily get us to where the future we need. Thanks, Michelle, again, we really look forward to this. Thanks so much, Mark, for that kind introduction. It's really been a pleasure to meet and reconnect with so many amazing WashU faculty. It's it's a terrific institution with just such a strong commitment to research and quality and education. And I absolutely, next time, will be in person. Um, I'm really thrilled to be giving Department of Medicine grand rounds and talking about how we get to delivering care that matters. So I'm going to share my slides here. Um, and the host has disabled screen sharing. So we should probably fix that, Stephanie, if we can. Sorry, I didn't try that out earlier. Give us a, a little hot second here. Yeah, so sorry about that. Let me No problem. I'm 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 good. We've done it. Excellent. Um, Mark, can you give me a thumbs up if you can see my slides? Yes, I can. Perfect. Excellent. So I have no disclosures. Um oh, I did want to start with how how did I get here? Unfortunately, not physically there, but how, how did I get here giving this talk? One of the things that I love about UCSF is you really can ask anyone their story. I've learned so much by asking those around me, you know, what experiences or epiphanies shaped where you are today? I encourage trainees and junior faculty trying to craft a career um, to ask those around them, how do you spend your day? And do you love it? At UCSF, we make all visiting professors start their talk by sharing a little bit about their journey. And so I thought by way of introduction, I'd share some of my journey and how I became interested in QI. So imagine this, you are taking care of an 82 year old man, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, EF of 35%. He's been admitted four times in the last three months for volume overload. And you treat him back to uvolemia. And as the patient is nearing, nearing discharge, you wonder, hmm, saw this paper in the New England Journal of Medicine recently, should I be using acetazolamide to minimize its chances of recurrent hospitalization? Or maybe you're thinking, have I explored barriers to med adherence like cognitive impairment? Will the discharge summary really reach the PCP? Has anyone had a goals of care discussion? And, you know, I remember being a resident and trying to figure out what specialty I was going to go into. And my peers loving their consulting months because they got to practice cutting edge medicine without ever really having to go through the heroic task of safely discharging a patient. And there I was as a medicine resident thinking, but man, 
who doesn't love a really solid discharge plan? And I guess I still struggle with the idea that we wrangle over these clinical decisions that change outcomes by degrees, but we miss the big picture of whether patients can afford their meds. Do they understand their discharge instructions? And whether their PCP 40 miles away is going to know about the complex plan that I've put in place. So I love evidence-based medicine just as much as you all. But if we go back to Sackett et al.'s definition of um, evidence-based medicine that says, okay, let's combine our individual clinician expertise with the best evidence we have in the literature with the goals that our patient has for their care, we're kind of missing something. And what we're missing is this idea of effective implementation. And that's really what I want to talk about today, because that idea that evidence-based medicine fails if we can't effectively implement is one of the cornerstones of QI. And it's really why I went into quality improvement in the first place. So how do I define quality improvement? Well, credit to the slide goes to Vikas Parekh, who is the chief quality officer at U of M. And he and I collaborate on some projects. And you know, he, he gave me this figure, which says, if we think about what quality improvement is, it is really that implementation of evidence-based medicine over time in the service of improved patient outcomes. And that can be anything from, you know, bundles preventing collapse or door to balloon times for acute MI or lung protective ventilation for ARDS. In all of these ways, adherence to evidence-based medicine has improved outcomes over time. There's just one problem, and that is that our actual practice, the way we actually provide care, always seems to lag behind the evidence. So there's this implementation gap. And I guess I would just ask you, you can't turn to your neighbor because we're all virtual. Um, I guess I would just ask you all to think to yourself, why, why do we have this gap? What is driving this consistent gap between our actual practice and evidence-based medicine? Now, I get a lot of, when I ask this question to our trainees, to our faculty, I get a lot of, well, Michelle, you know, change is hard. People are busy. It's hard to disseminate new knowledge. There's not enough attention to the social drivers of health. You know, the system we practice in, it just isn't designed to give the care, give the right outcomes across the continuum of care. The good news is whatever you came up with, you're all right. All of you, yes, the point is that we don't try hard enough to understand the problem. And whether you're asking like, hey, why are these people in LA who attend this 24 hour fitness uh, not losing weight? Um, that act of asking, why do we have this problem is really at the foundation and cornerstone of effective implementation. And let me tell you, in the dark closet of my failed quality improvement projects, there are many well-intentioned solutions that I did not take the time to understand the gap, and thus I did not understand the whole problem. And it isn't just me. Here are some of my favorites. Um, when the Joint Commission thought, oh, well, we can close that gap on getting clinicians to wash their hands and, and use gel when they gel in by having them wear a button that um, tells them to ask, encourages patients to ask if they've washed their hands. Not really matching the solution with the actual problem there. Um, another favorite is when the, um, the HCAP scores were encouraging providers to do everything they could to help with the patient's pain in service to addressing the patient's pain, when that was ignoring some of the barriers clinicians face and some of the dangers to patients in um, optimizing pain control in the hospital. And last, a favorite I'm sure for Mark and I is those early studies that tried to analyze what are the risks for re hospital readmission and how do we prevent them? And maybe if we do a timely discharge summary or we communicate with a primary care doctor, that's gonna really help readmissions when most of the models actually ignored social drivers of health, with, which were the foundation of so many challenges for, for readmission. And this really highlights that ineffective improvements happen when you don't take the time to understand the problem. Turns out, you know, 
maybe we're not entirely to blame because, you know, healthcare, it's just complicated. Um, I'm sure many of you in the audience recognize this. This is a drawing by Rube Goldberg, known as a Rube Goldberg device. He was an engineer turned cartoonist who liked to reimagine what should be really simple processes into complex ones. So lifting the spoon to take a bite eventually triggers a knack and swing to wipe his mouth, but only after a really complex series of spe steps that involve a cracker and a parrot and a scythe uh, cutting the string that swings the knack into his mouth. And Kaveh Shojanya, who's the vice chair of QI in the Department of Medicine at University of Toronto, he analogizes many of our healthcare processes to a Rube Goldberg device. You know, medication reconciliation, the discharge process, even rooming a patient in clinic, these processes are much more complicated than they appear on the service. And generally as clinicians, we know our small part in the process and our solution, we look at the problem, we're like, ah, we need another parrot. We need a bigger rocket. Um, and when really the, the responsibility is to take a step back, ask more questions, understand the whole process and see maybe there's a way to blow it up. An example from our institution, for years, residents and fellows have been justly complaining about the time it takes to wait on hold and schedule a follow-up appointment for their hospitalized patients to get them in to see them in clinic. Our solution, hey, let's hire an inpatient scheduler so that the residents and fellows can spend their time requesting the appointment of the inpatient scheduler and the inpatient scheduler can then wait on hold um, if, instead of the residents doing it ignoring the fact that maybe the better way was to create an automated scheduling system so no one had to wait on hold so that our discharging patients could get back into the follow-up appointments for their clinic by using an online scheduling tool for direct scheduling, which is where we're trying to move to now. So armed with this information that we need to think more thoughtfully about the problem, we need to take a step back, and um, we need to ask more questions. How, once a gap has been identified, how do we do better? How, what, what is the right, are, are the right tools we use for improvement? Today, we're gonna talk about that QI journey we've taken in healthcare, what we've learned from it, and where do we go from here? And I like to think about the elements of QI like a pyramid, without which our interventions are always going to fail. So let's think about what the sides of our QI pyramid are. Um, think to yourself, at UCSF and maybe at WashU, when we were early in our QI journey, what do you think the first intervention that was always suggested was? Um, anytime we would bring up a problem, the first idea always was like, we should make a pocket card. I don't know if this was a problem at, at WashU, but man, one day I decided to take out all of the pocket cards and it was like steps for writing an advanced care planning note to get it into the advanced care planning navigator, um, how to reduce delirium, communication best practices. I mean, man, I had a pocket card for everything. And, you know, I listened for the last two weeks before I came here of all the times somebody said to me, you know, Michelle, we just need to teach the house staff that. And it's true. We do need to teach the house staff all these things, but it, education alone is not going to be sufficient. All the educators in the audience are likely familiar with the Ebbinghaus forgetting curve, a proven and yes, very sad curve about how much information we retain about six days after discharge. I mean, after receiving new information. And really this curve just you know keeps on going all the way down. And it's really hard to retain information upon receipt of teaching. And this is true if you're learning about you know, the four types of RTA as if you're learning how to effectively discharge a patient on IV antibiotics. This was backed up by a study um, called No Magic Bullets. They looked at a systematic review of 102 trials of interventions to improve professional practice. And given the era, this was pretty early in the QI journey for healthcare. And most of these interventions were education, conferences, guidelines and protocols, campaigns, and, and were largely unsuccessful in creating sustainable improvement. So education is gonna be the first side of our prism here, but it's probably not gonna be sufficient. 
Of course, the gold standard we all think of when we think of um, improvement is that system change through human-centered design. Designing our care delivery to make the right thing to do the easy thing to do. And increasingly, thanks Eric for this fabulous quote, um, increasingly, this means adopting digital solutions through our EMR. And there are some clear and easy and early wins for really changing the way people deliver care in order to facilitate QI. Uh, this is one of my favorites. It's from Ken Volpe's uh, Center for Innova Health Innovation at Penn. Their institution was really struggling with providers continuing to order brand meds over generic meds, which cost both their institution and their patients a significant amount of money. And so they looked into their EMR to try and understand, well, why was this happening? Why were providers automatically seeming to default to this brand ordering? And what they found is that the brand meds were listed above all of the generic medications in their EMR. And they found that by just flipping that switch, you can see somewhere around the 15th of November, just by flipping that switch, dramatically, almost overnight, providers started to change to generic. Um, the generic rate of prescribing went from about 70% to 98.4% in just one week. Now, there's one medication, and you may see, like, hey, what? why did that medication change? Like, what's that medication that's lagging? It's it's levothyroxine. And it's interesting that even the system change that was so powerful for every other drug failed to move the needle because it went against the provider's belief on the reliability of brand dosing. We'll talk a little bit about uh, the importance of that lesson as well. Um, at our institution, we found that same uh, change when we moved to electronic discharge summaries. Again, I'm dating myself a bit. This was in 2010, uh, before widespread EMR usage. And we moved from dictated discharge summaries to a very early rudimentary phase of electronic ones. Now, before this time, um, uh, Puya and Stephanie, you will appreciate this. Um, the chief residents at every site had a list taped to their door of interns who had not completed discharge summaries on their patients. And they'd have to like hunt them down. And so these poor interns would do discharge summaries at like 4 a.m. in the middle of their call night. And we had dictations of residents like falling asleep mid-discharge summary uh, because they just couldn't stay awake. And it took residents an average of four days to complete the discharge summary and attendings an average of nine days to sign them. And then, you know, all the transcription nonsense had to happen. And it was not infrequent at all to readmit a patient without a discharge summary explaining their last hospitalization. And since all of our notes were paper, you literally had nothing except their labs to try and piece together what happened on their last hospitalization. So we led a quality improvement to build a very rudimentary tool to draw labs um, and some radiology into a templated discharge summary. And we told interns, you know what? Not only are we gonna try and make it easier for you to do this discharge summary, it's gonna count as your last day's progress note. And we told attendings, it's gonna count as your note for the day as well. And you can see that over the course of several months as we rolled this out, we improved a discharge summary completion on the day of discharge and signage within attending in, in 24, in 48 hours. So some powerful examples of how really changing the system of care, the way we deliver care uh, can result in immediate and lasting change. But I gotta tell you, while these two examples, you know, of system change using technology are, are very rosy, our attempts to drive system change through the EMR hasn't always been as fruitful. We did an analysis at UCSF and found that our, our naivety in or building order sets um, when we first launched our EMR caught up with us. Only um, We did an analysis of 100 order sets built in our EMR. They were designed to improve quality, standardized practice. Only 17% are used regularly. And despite our attempt to severely limit pop-ups, pop-up alerts and best practice alerts to like the most important safety challenges and quality challenges at UCSF. Um, we failed to really achieve any actual decision support and uh, these alerts are largely, largely ignored and bypassed. So how do we 
get through this? Um, how do we move past studies like this one where they looked at point of care reminders on clinicians, pop-up alerts, care suggestions, recommendations for like a dose adjustment for creatinine, um, attempts to get people to order things in accordance with best practice. Care improved, but not by much. They looked at things like, what was the percent improvement in ordering of a long-acting muscarinic added to someone's COPD regimen uh, after a hospitalization? Or the percent of patients getting their lipids checked? These things improved by an average of 4% um, as a result of all of our computerized interventions which isn't a really significant change and not enough to drive improvement in healthcare, despite a lot of money being spent in health IT. So where do we go from here? How do we use our EMR effectively? I'd love to share with you some things that we've done at UCSF um, that trying to harness the power of the EMR to drive change. The first is um, working with Nader Najafi. We really tried to tackle excessive telemetry use at our institution. And man, we had tried everything. We had had a telemetry czar. We had, you know, uh, we would review all of the telemetry from the orders from the night before and page people asking them, does your patient still really need telemetry? I know it seemed like it at 2 a.m. last night, but how about at 9 a.m. this morning? Um, and, you know, we would make gains while we were doing the intervention and then we would slide right back to the mean. So we decided that, okay, maybe we can use our EMR to automatically discontinue telemetry. And you can see that we ask people to select a reason for telemetry here, and that programs an automatic discontinuation. And right at a certain time frame, whether it's 24 hours, 48 hours, and certainly there are some indications like patients on defetilide where you never want to discontinue telemetry during their hospitalization. So for patients, say, who the indication providers um, put was sepsis for telemetry on admission. Um, at uh, 24 hours, they get an alert that says, hey, you know, does your patient still need telemetry? We're going to discontinue it unless you take an action. And so using this automatic discontinuation, we were able to reduce our telemetry rates by over 20%. And Nader since worked with colleagues at several other health systems to adopt the same um, EPIC uh, order set at their institution, and they saw similar gains as well. Um, worked with Ari Hoffman, another amazing hospitalist at our institution, to try and improve care delivery for COPD. Um, we wanted more goal concordant uh, NEBS to MDI usage. We wanted more patients discharged to pulmonary rehab. We wanted um, all of our COPD patients to be seen by respiratory therapy during their hospitalization for education and to make sure they were using their inhalers correctly. But no one was opening the, opening the COPD order set. So we built an al analytic algorithm that based on what was done in the ED, someone ordered NEBS in the ED or prednisone in the ED, um, it ordered spirometry in the ED, Pay, the COPD order set would automatically be tacked onto the admission order set. The providers didn't have to do anything. It just pulled the order set in as part of that patient's core order set. And we increased um, not only the rates of COPD order set usage, great, but we increased a lot of the process measures that we were hoping for, like RT teaching and pulmonary rehab. You can see how we're getting like a little more sophisticated each time we're asking the clinicians to do a little less. Um, another of my favorites is working with Sajan Patel, who is now our Director of Quality Improvement and Patient Safety for our Division of Hospital Medicine. And he was really interested in de-escalation and how we improve value of care and wanted to de-escalate overnight vital signs. So he worked with our informatics group to create a machine learning algorithm that identified patients who, based on their um, vital signs in the last 48 hours and other clinical parameters of what floor they were on, um, their nursing needs would decrease vital signs, would prompt the providers to decrease vital signs to every eight hours. And uh, it would come in the form of a nudge. When you opened your orders, it would say, you have a notification that's a nudge. And you open the nudge and it tells you um, your patient's risk score if you were to 
uh, discontinue vital signs or uh, reduce vital signs to every eight hours. And through this, we significantly increased the number of patients who were getting at least six hours of uninterrupted time overnight because we were taking away those overnight vital signs. And this was part of a, a broader intervention to try and promote sleep in the hospital. The last um, example I'll give you of trying to use the EMR to do system change is work I did with Tim Judson and two of our consultants, Lowell Lowe, who's a, uh, um, a nephrologist and Rob Rushikoff, who's an endocrinologist. And Tim and I asked, hey, what if we try and not ask anything of the clinician? What if we just had the EMR based on what it knows, call a friendly e-consult? So we found examples in the EMR where we thought that the, there was enough information there to call their own consult. You know, patients with bad hyper or hypoglycemia, patients with bad hyponatremia were automatically added to an e-consult list for Lowell and Rob. And they followed up these and wrote a brief templated e-consult note on what they thought was going on and their recommendations for change. The rates of hyper and hypoglycemia fell significantly across the hospital, and there was a trend toward duration, shorter duration of hyponatremia. And let me tell you, tons of love for our master clinician, Lowell, when you get this like beautifully written e-consult that just um, tells you, like, based on what you've ordered, based on the clinical parameters, what the best, most likely rationale for the patient's hyponatremia is. We're now exploring this for discharge um, IV antibiotic selection and duration for palliative care, for um, allergy testing for patients with penicillin allergies and hep C treatment, initiating that in the hospital. Those are all cases where the EMR probably knows enough um, to guide care. So um, education and systems change are clearly going to be two of the foundational pillars that we use in our quality improvement journey, but they're not actually sufficient. Change requires more. So maybe wondering, okay, what, what are these other two pillars Michelle's gonna talk about? To introduce the next one, I'd like you to, to take a test with me. Um, and since I don't think we have um, chat access or Q&A access, um, I'm going to um, just ask you to, to be on the honor system here with, with our, our test. It's, it's a pretty simple test. I don't want to worry you. Um, there are four cards involved in the scenario. The only thing you need to know about these cards is that they have letters on one side and they have numbers on the other side. And your job is to try and test a rule. And that rule is if a card has a vowel on one side, it has an even number on the other side. I'll say that again. The rule you're trying to test is if a card has a vowel on one side, it has an even number on the other side. And my question is, which card or cards must be turned over to determine whether the rule is followed? Is it turnover A only? If a card has a vowel on one side, it must have an even number on the other side. Okay. Turnover A and four. Okay, turn over A and seven or turn over A and D. I'll ask you to think about your answer. If a card has a vowel on one side, it must have an even number on the other side. Which cards do I need to turn over to prove this rule? Now, most people when faced with this, pick A and four. They're like, well, I want to confirm my rule A turn it over, does it have an even number? And then does the four have, a, um, a, a, sorry, if a card has a vowel on one side, it has an even number on the other side, A clearly proves the rule. Um, and most people wanna turn over four as well. It turns out that wasn't our rule. If four has a consonant on the other side, that's fine. A consonant can have an even number or an odd number. The other card you really wanna turn over is the seven because Turning over the seven also is necessary to make sure you're following the rule. If the seven card has a vowel on the other side, you've disproven the rule. And uh, this is a, a fun test because it's a great example of what we know about human behavior. 
that we are subject to confirmation bias. We seek examples to confirm what we already know, turning over the A and the four, rather than disproving it, turning over the seven. Sometimes we need to be confronted with data contradictory to our self-perception. This was never more true than um, when doing work around dis safe discharge transitions. We would discharge patients and we would just assume that all went well because we did not have any data to suggest the contrary. And when you, when you really harness the power of audit and feedback to show people that there's actually minimal improvement in their professional practice, whether it's prescribing practices, age-appropriate cancer screening, or rates of readmission, it, it becomes a really powerful um, tool to sort of confront people's native beliefs about their own performance. And when confronted with valid data, people change their perceptions and were more likely to change their practice. Hence the power of audit and feedback. So our next pillar is really thinking about finding valid measurement targets, providing that team or ideally individual feedback that really drives that awareness of how we're actually providing and um, changing performance. So let's look what this literature says. Um, the, there was a Cochrane review and meta-analysis on the effectiveness of audit and feedback to try and improve practice. And it did show an improvement, but it was pretty modest. And it left a lot of folks scratching their head and asking, well, why did audit and feedback not have more dramatic results when we know that confronted with our own performance is a huge motivator? Is it powerful? Is it not? Unfortunately, I'm going to tell you, you know, the healthcare community, we, we have some issues with measurement. What do I mean by that? Let's take a historical example of quality measurement. Um, smoking cessation, foundational measurement from CMS. Now, measuring the number of people who help you quit smoking is an amazing measure. If we could get people to stop smoking, we would save hundreds of lives. We'd likely improve quality of life, the health benefits of quitting smoking are really impactful. And it seems like we could all get behind that as a quality measure. So naturally CMS created a core measure around smoking cessation for hospitalized patients. Now, as they thought about it, they're like, ooh, creating a, a measure uh, around actually measuring which patients stopped smoking or the effectiveness of their counseling, hmm. Seems pretty daunting for a quality measure, especially back in you know the late 90s, early 2000s when this measure was adopted. So they thought, okay, mm, what's the next best thing? Okay, well, we can measure if smoking cessation counseling happened. Great, let's, let's tell hospitals you have to report your rates of smoking cessation counseling. Now, what do you think happened? Well, you know, every hospital, including ours, um, put this blanket statement in their discharge paperwork that was like, hey, you know, if you sto smoke, stop smoking. And, you know, maybe we'll, if you're a smoker, we'll, we'll put a little line in there. Look at how much room we have in there for our plan for quitting. And when our measurements don't feel valid to clinicians, audit and feedback doesn't work. We, we really invalidated this quality improvement measure by making it a checkbox rather than actual measure of quality care. And this challenge really persists though to a lesser degree when you're looking at outcome measures. Sometimes what we wanna measure is, is, is not feasible and what we can measure um, is not as good as what we wanna measure. Take Mark and I's favorite quality measure of 30-day uh, readmissions. Something we're passionate about, something that can be really tied to the quality of care that we provide. Now, what we'd really love to measure is preventable adverse events after discharge that use additional healthcare resources and cause patient harm. But since we can't reliably measure that, we measure readmissions instead. And you know there are real consequences to not getting this measure feedback and the measure intensity right. Um, we did a study at, at UCSF of a randomized controlled trial of intensive audit and feedback for three discharge quality measures for our inpatient teams. We randomized four of our medicine teams to, you know, getting a dashboard of their discharge quality, as well as weekly feedback sessions to talk about the quality measures and review their team's performance against a control group who just got access to the dashboard 
um, but really didn't have any attempts at audit and feedback with that dashboard. And sure enough, our teams performed the test and we, we really tried to, to find the most um, actionable, meaningful, impactful quality measures. We looked at a measure of accurate medication reconciliation using the um, best home medication list we could find. Um, we looked at the discharge summary in 24 hours and a high quality after visit summary that had patient-centered discharge instructions, a follow-up appointment, um, and a callback number for the patient. And though patients, although all of our teams improved to the test, what we found is they actually started to resent this really intensive audit and feedback. And the teams felt that there was a cost to this audit and feedback that um, there was this undue focus on the measures to the exclusion of others that they fight, felt might better represent a more holistic patient care quality. And this has been a huge challenge as we think about measurement in healthcare. The proliferation of so many measures um, for quality, many of whom don't feel valid and meaningful to clinicians. So we need to continue to measure. It can't go away, but it does need to be scaled back. It needs to be allowed to mature. Um, certainly there are examples in healthcare where measurement of hospital acquired conditions has led to a greater emphasis on prevention, most likely saved lives. On the other hand, measuring whether doctors documented they provided discharge instructions to stop smoking, it sounds good, but ended up being an exercise in futile box checking. So how do we navigate this? How do we think about measurement at UCSF? And how do I think about measurement as I'm implementing quality improvement? I used you know, four tenets. One is some of these external quality measures that we're asked to measure are really important. As I said, measuring central line infections, we really have saved lives here by decreasing the rate of quality, uh, decreasing the rate of collapses. And I would say, if you don't like the measure, tweak it so that it does represent quality. You are part of an amazing academic institution with foundational quality leaders and amazing research and implementation science. And the idea of building a measure that actually people can rally around and people can get passionate about, I think is the best way to incentivize quality and do really meaningful audit and feedback. Um, we changed our, we eventually got smart and changed our smoking cessation quality measure. Um, we looked at the rate of a smoking cessation counseling note um, in the chart and the rates of patients discharged on smoking cessation uh, aids like lozenges and gum. My third pillar is do those important things that aren't related to an external quality measure. Things like health equity for every quality measure. We have a, um, a quality scorecard at our health system um, health system level. And the champions of those pillars, each one of them is asked to measure that quality across race, ethnicity, language, and socioeconomic status. Uh, we're measuring things like the timeliness of inpatient consult recommendations, patients who are lost to follow up in subspecialty clinics, code blues on the floor, inpatient advanced care planning documentation, time spent in the EMR after hours, and collaboration across divisions and departments for grants and publications. And lastly, I would say, just wait. We're getting better at measuring quality. This is happening nationally as we examine new holistic quality measures that um, look at how well healthcare organizations perform in keeping Medicare beneficiaries alive out of the facility at lower cost. One of my favorite quality measures, which I hope will come to fruition, is days at home for Medicare beneficiaries. Forget looking at readmissions. How about not admitting that patient for a primary care specific condition in the first place and looking at the number of days that patients actually spend at home, trying to increase our skilled nursing facility utilization, keeping patients functional when they're in the hospital. There's really um, so many positives to using a holistic quality measure like this. The other quality measurement I'm really excited about is increasing the use of patient reported outcome measures or prompts. The National Quality Forum says, you know, these are a patient report of their own health um, that, that they feel like is impactful. And the society has actually come up with patient reported outcomes for a whole host of diseases. 
In my work in the Center for Digital Health Innovation, I worked with two amazing clinicians, Steve Hayes, um, who's a director of our lung transplant program, and Uma Mahadevan, who's the director of our inflammatory bowel disease program. And they work to really deliver um, pa patient reported outcomes and an early warning system for patients based on these patient reported outcomes um, to identify patients who needed more outreach at the earliest sign of increased disease activity. And we delivered this uh, through a chatbot program where patients would answer some simple questions uh, on a daily or weekly basis to understand how we were doing in the outpatient setting at monitoring their health. Epic is now launched and made more sort of um, improved their patient reported outcome measure delivery through my chart. So we're getting pretty excited about uh, broadening this to rheumatologic diseases. We've just started work on patients receiving cytotoxic chemotherapy to, for early detection to help those patients stay out of the emergency department and for our type one diabetics. So it's all coming together now. Um, you're starting to see how all these sides of the pyramid really support each other to uphold a, a quality improvement project. We're not, we're not done yet um, because one of the um, most important reasons why quality improvement interventions haven't always been successful is this false idea that we can actually control the behavior of those interacting with the, with the system. And those of you who have kids, um, know that in your home lives and as well as your work lives, what we actually control of another person's behavior is quite limited. And not only do we not control very much, but those who we live with and work with, they're all subject to the forces of, I guess what I'll call gravity, those individual forces of what's going on around us. It's like the traffic on your way to work, a high hospital census, a broken MRI, several members of your team being sick on the same day. All of this affects um, how we interact with our system and our appetite towards change. But somewhere between what we control and the forces of gravity is our potential to influence. What makes someone get that video interpreter every time, even though they speak a little Spanish and you know, maybe they might be able to get by without it. Well, what makes a provider actually read the, the alert to discontinue telemetry and say, hey, yeah, that's a good idea. I don't need telemetry anymore. This patient's okay. What makes someone pull up a chair and have an important conversation with a patient about advanced care planning? Ron Heifetz, um, a professor of public policy at Harvard's Kennedy School, teaches that healthcare is filled not with technical problems where there's one right answer, but with adaptive problems. He says adaptive problems are problems that require the people themselves to change. In adaptive problems, the people are the problem and the people are the solution. And quality improvement is then about mobilizing and engaging people with the problem rather than trying to anesthetize them so you can just go and solve it on your own. And the influence we have over people is the culture we create. It's the shared values and beliefs that we communicate through our words, we through the resources we allocate to things and through our actions. And when we invest in improvements for patients and staff, we're showing these values um, in our organization. And so I call the last facade of this pyramid culture change. And I love thinking about like, how does culture change? How do you change the narrative of an organization? How do you get the word out? Um, and as the educators know, this really has to be from retention. You know, you're not gonna learn renal tubular acidosis the first time. You need to hear it again and hear it again and hear it again until you incorporate it into the way you practice. Um, so too it is with changing culture. The first time you hear an idea, it might not resonate, but hearing people say it again, hearing people commit resources to it, hearing people prioritize that initiative, slowly people will then say, hey, you know what? We're an institution that cares about this. Um, rep repeated exposure, repeated um, devotion of resources, that can really change culture um, and create a new narrative. A Diane Slivka, who's our chief physician experience officer, thinks about our UCSF culture and how we change culture all the time, especially around our work experience. She's created this amazing um, uh, 
newsletter. It goes out every Friday and it really shapes the way people think about how the things are happening at UCSF and especially around our worst pain points like parking um, or space allocation or um, being a family friendly institution. And she and I work together to uh, create a no novel lactation work RVU credit program where ambulatory clinicians actually get RVU credit for time spent lactating. And when we put out this one good thing about our work, those actions spoke volumes about how we spent our resources and what our priorities were at UCSF. So, you know, I'm optimistic about quality improvement. It's a young field. It has historically had a lot less funding. When you look at the effect sizes in a lot of these trials, these seminal trials, they're bigger than the effect sizes in a lot of randomized controlled clinical trials. And I think we're improving on so many of the problems that we talked about. Measurement is improving. We're really focusing on health equity and the social drivers of all of our traditional health outcomes to be able to move those needles. There's more focus on evidence against low value care and focus on patient reported outcome measures and increasing use of digital automation to drive quality. And I think we are finally getting closer to the goal set forth in this great paper by some QI luminaries of, a, of working smarter and not harder, not doing QI on the backs of clinicians or designing processes that add work of adding that extra rocket into our um, Rube Goldberg device with better questions up front, better planning, better technology. And by involving clinicians in the work, we're getting closer to our goal of QI and process improvement, reducing work for our clinicians. So I'm pretty hopeful about our ability to improve healthcare quality, but that doesn't mean it's not gonna be hard. Which reminds me of one of the great American classics and one of my favorite books, uh, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Now, if you haven't read this book, it's the story of a father and son who take a journey on a motorcycle and talk about how to, how to approach life and the pursuit of a quality life. And of course, all in the context of motorcycle maintenance. And at one point, the son asks his father, well, is it hard? And the dad asks, dad answers, not if you have the right attitudes. It's having the right attitudes that's hard. And you know, so too is it with QI. If you have the right attitudes, QI becomes a lot easier. And so it's setting that culture. Um, anyone know who this guy is? This is Don Obedient. He's one of the founding followers of Quality Improvement. And he really set that tone for the attitude to improvement and change being the most important part. Though he was the one who founded um, our, our measures of process and quality, I mean, sorry, a structure and process and outcomes. Um, he, near his death, was worried that QI had gotten too mechanized, uh, he thought it was too industrial and didn't have enough heart. And somebody asked him, what is the secret to quality improvement? And he said, the secret to quality is love. You have to love your profession, love your patients and love your God. It's having the right attitudes that is hard. And the desire to make things better around you really has to come from a place of love. And so for me, that's the floor of my QI pyramid. You have to be able to tap into that love and make other people tap into that love when doing any improvement work. Otherwise, it's gonna be pretty hard. We are incredibly lucky as physicians to have as our life's work, something so full of meaning. Um, we come to work every day to discover, to heal, to inquire, to teach. But sometimes that meaning eludes us amidst everything that doesn't work in medicine. And that's precisely why we need quality improvement, why we need implementation science, why we need operational improvement, because processes that work well for us and for patients, well, they help bring that love and that meaning back and they really rejuvenate us to do more. So I will leave you with this poem um, that was quoted by a Singapore physician um, of an unknown source that has always really impacted me. And, is sort of why I get up every day and why I have taken this journey um, to not only do quality improvement, but improve the science behind quality improvement. 
Thank you all so much. It's been such a pleasure. And I'll stop share and uh, maybe take some questions if the format allows. Oh, wait, hold on. We can't forget our CME and our MOC. Thank you, Stephanie. I gotcha. Um, so I will leave this on for um, a, a bit while we, we take any questions. Yeah, Dr. Murad, thank you so much. Um, I mean, this is a wonderful talk and I think so applicable to all of us who work in any hospital. And um, while certainly I'm monitoring the um, the chat in case anyone does put in a chat in the Q&A session, we'll see that. But I do have one question um, that I kind of think about a lot. And you mentioned, you know, with the Ebbinghaus forgetfulness curve and kind of the need for re-exposure. And certainly I think that's so applicable in whatever we do. How do you reconcile then at times you know, when it's just that the system needs like EMR prompts and uh, more utilization against when it's just almost a, a knowledge deficiency amongst physicians that just really, we need to do better, you know, at, at learning and remembering things, you know, how do you reconcile those together? Yeah, I think that's such a great point, Stephanie, and inherent in that is also this idea that, um, of designing for sustainability, because that knowledge gap is always going to be there, right? Like we work in an academic institution, we're always going to have trainees. So if you have an educational intervention, you need to ask yourself, how am I designing my education for sustainability? And is that going to be enough? And, and I would argue um, that taking this multimodal approach by asking yourself, okay, where are there gaps in education? What can be done with a system right now? Um, and where do we need to show people how they're doing? Doing all three of those regularly and repeated can actually turn things into, oh, this is just the way we do things around here, which is just what, what we want. And you know, looking across transitions in care, we've seen that. We used to discharge patients without a med list. Can you believe it? Like we discharge them with a prescription. It was a triplicate. There was like the white copy, the yellow copy, the pink copy. They took it to the pharmacy. The pharmacy ripped off the pink copy, gave it to the patient and kept the white copy, the only one that was actually legible. So like we have, no one would ever think to do that now. So we've done a combination of like education, the importance of a like well-reconciled med list. We've done the systems change where the EMR helps you do med rec. We've done it where there's now an after visit summary that the patients take home on paper and electronically. And, and that's our culture now. That's the way you do a good med discharge. And so you can see how like those elements really connect to create some sustainable. So thinking about what is gonna be the state sustainability of all of those sides of your pyramid is gonna give your QI the best chance for success. And rarely is the answer just gonna be, we have to teach the health staff that. Okay. Oh, that's also very interesting from a, uh, there's so much to learn standpoint, you know, and it's not, it's not just a uh, personal deficiencies here. Absolutely. Um, we do have a few questions in the chat. Uh, I think we have a, yeah, a few more minutes. Um, first question is how do you approach QI outside of the hospital? Oh, I think that's such a good question because the partnership that we need now with our community resources um, is more important than ever. I know that um, WashU is struggling with long length of stay before discharge to a skilled nursing facility, as we are here in San Francisco. And one of the things that we've really struggled with and are figuring out our way through is how do we partner with institutions that, that our, aren't ours? Um, and really, how do we make that case for change? And it's it starts with alignment. What do we both want? What do we both need? What are our mutual goals? It's the why behind what we're doing it, this, and it has to be more than a metric, um, and it has to be more than money, um, and really finding that alignment with your partners and finding where there are like-minded resources to bear um, to align those goals is, is um, the best way forward. Certainly. Uh, maybe one last question. How do you hardwire engaging hospitalists, subspecialists, and nursing into team-based QI initiatives? Awesome question. Um, we at UCSF have really de developed a common framework 
you know, we had some people over here using lean, some people over there using model for improvement, some people over here using, you know, what not, what how, homegrown quality improvement. And a couple of years ago as an institution, we said, you know what, I think this would be a lot better if we all were speaking the same QI language and underwent a huge effort to say, okay, let's just make A3s from lean the way we approach a problem. And so whenever when you're meeting and people are like, no, we really need to stay on the left side of the A3 here. That's the why we have the problem and not on the solutioning. Everybody from our medical students to our CEO knows exactly what that means. Um, and so once you all start speaking the same language, um, it, it gets a lot easier to start talking about the problems in the same way. And um, it starts being easier to say, hey, our lean institution can actually speak to students and speak to faculty and speak to nurses. And so it's the institutions and training speaking with one voice. And our lean education team is a multidisciplinary team that each has a responsibility for doing that, edu ed, um, that edu education and training the trainers um, across our multiple areas. Um, so that, that shared language and that shared education has been really helpful into making sure that everybody is engaged in speaking the same language. And we're peeking at the next question, which is like prioritizing, speaking with the same language, common language about what problems we're trying to solve and why these are the most important problems for our institution right now is also helped by having this shared knowledge because we're all not only speaking with the same language about how we're going to solve the problem, but we're speaking the same language about why those are the problems that we need to be that need to be solved right now? Yeah, almost sounds more so, um, so succinctly put, and I'm sure so much so hard to implement. Oh my goodness, I totally made that sound better than, than it actually is for sure. But that's the vision. That's the vision. Well, once again, thank you so much. And for anyone who has any additional questions or even wants to know more about how to get involved in some of these projects um, here at BJH, I'd Pat, feel free to email me and I can at least find the right people to put you in touch with. And if something I said resonated with you, my email was up on that last slide, please feel free to email me. I'm, I really wish I could be there in person and want to be available to as many Wash U folks as I can. Yeah, thanks, Michelle. That was terrific. Really appreciate you taking the time to tell us about your journey and what you're accomplishing. There are lots that we can learn. Thank you all.